In this video, we're going to be talking about the importance of the assessment process um, in medical emergencies. Throughout the video, there's going to be times when I'm going to ask you to pause it um, and have a think about what's been discussed to that point. Um, I'll give you some questions to try and answer and just make some notes and then you can carry on with the video uh, um, and sort of see how you're getting on. This gives you the opportunity to test your knowledge, see where you are at the moment and see what you need to do to, to refine that knowledge. So medical emergencies are something that none of us want to come across but inevitably it will happen at some point in our careers, hopefully not too frequently. However, with it not being a frequent occurrence and also with it being a stressful situation, it can be hard when that does happen for you to think logically and efficiently about what's happening. So it's very important that we have clear, regimented assessment processes that we go through for every single patient who presents with something that has the potential to be a medical emergency. And the way we do this is we use the information from the Resource Council UK and we use their um, algorithms and their acronyms to help us maintain uh, the same process every time. So the first thing I want you to do um, when you pause the video shortly is to think about what acronym I'm talking about. So by acronym, I mean a, a set of letters that um, are the first letter of each of the words in the sequence. Um, so there's an acronym that we use when we're dealing with medical emergencies um, that you need to have really clear in your head. So I want you to think what that acronym is, and what each of those letters stand for. So the acronym I was referring to, as I'm sure you've got, is D R S A B C. Or sometimes you'll hear people refer to it as Doctors A B C. Now this is something that you are familiar with. We've talked about it many a time when we've done your BLS training. So every year um, we do your BLS refresher um, and we always go through this doctor's ABC process. And I think what happens is sometimes we forget that that is not just about people who are in cardiac arrest. In fact, what the ultimate aim that you're trying to do with managing a medical emergency is prevent it getting to the cardiac arrest process. So when we've done this before, you've probably been thinking about um, not getting any response from a patient, the patient not breathing, this type of thing. But in actual fact, regardless of the way the patient presents, we need to go through this set, rigid assessment process to make sure we aren't missing bits out. If you just take a second to imagine how you're going to feel when you're presented with a patient who is acutely unwell in front of you. The information that you have in your head is going to be flying around, it's going to be a bit confusing, you're going to have a lot of um, adrenaline for the anxiety going on at that moment in time. If we have this very straightforward DRS ABC at the front of our mind, will be able to manage that situation much more efficiently and much more effectively. So let's go through each of these and think about what they stand for. So D stands for dangers. Now that could be dangers to you as the person that's going in to assist or to whoever is with you, or it could be to the patient. So classically in the dental surgery, you're probably thinking about is the patient in the chair, could they fall off the chair? Um, uh, are there any sharp instruments on your bracket table nearby? Is the light sitting low that they could bang their head on? So just removing the dangers from them and for you to allow you to safely carry on with your assessment. If it's not safe to approach the patient, don't do it because you will end up in uh, potentially in a medical emergency situation as well and then you can't help anyone. R stands for response. So, <clears throat> can the patient respond to you? And more importantly, is it a normal response? 
the patient may well be able to acknowledge that you've said something to them or that you've given them a shake, but are they actually able to say, yes, I, I can hear you? The way in which we check a response is generally quite um, curt or sometimes even a little bit aggressive. You know, you're going to give somebody a good shake. A normal response is, why are you shaking me? Or don't do that. You know, it's not a pleasant thing. So can they respond and is it a normal response is important? The S stands for shout. And what we mean by check is shout for help, obviously. We never want to be dealing with these type of things on our own. And in the workplace, we shouldn't ever be on our own. Um, you should always have a nurse with you to assess when you're having treatment, or even you know, if you're just escorting the patient, say, from reception to the surgery, there will always be somebody in the vicinity. In fact, that's an absolute GDC requirement um, that there are at least two trained members of staff available at all the time. So getting somebody to help you, you may not need to shout. It may be that the person in the room with you, but the help is the important part of that. So if we've checked for dangers and removed them all, the patient has responded, either hasn't responded or has not responded in a normal way and you've got help. And then we need to move on to an assessment of their situation, their circumstances. So A stands for airway. Now, it really depends as to what the person's response was as to how you're going to check their airway. Um, if the patient is sat upright and is making sounds, it would suggest that there's nothing wrong with their airway. You don't necessarily need to look in their mouth. In fact, if a patient is responding abnormally, potentially is maybe a little bit um, confused, a little potential for aggression, um, you definitely don't want to be putting your hands in their mouth. So if the patient is conscious, then the airway check could be more straightforward than if a patient is unconscious, in which case you're going to actually need to look in their mouth and make sure that they're able to maintain that airway. So that's your head tilt, chin lift. But for the purposes of this assessment, of this um, presentation, sorry, we are talking about conscious patients. So if the patient can speak to you, their airway is fine. Similarly with B, which stands for breathing, if the patient can talk, then they're breathing, they are able to breathe. But what you need to be able to notice is, is the breathing abnormally fast or abnormally slow? So when we think about breathing, it's not just, are they breathing? It's, are they breathing normally? And then the last thing would be circulation. Now, this is one that's always quite difficult for us to check. Um, because we're not used to routinely taking a pulse. But again, if the patient is conscious, there shouldn't be a need to take a pulse. Instead, you would be looking for things like their colour um, and um, their colour of their lips, their general appearance. That's going to give you more information about your circulation than you would get, um, than you would necessarily need to for going and taking a pulse. So this DRS ABC or Doctors ABC is the process to use for all patients, regardless of whether they're conscious or not. And if you get a normal response, then that's fine. There is no medical emergency. If you do not get a normal response, you need to go through all the others. Just because the patient has an open airway doesn't mean that they're breathing normally. And just because a patient is breathing doesn't mean that their circulation, again, is normal. So all the way through all of this, and if the answer to all of these is normal, then there is no medical emergency. But if the answer to any of these is not normal, not normal for that patient, then we need to use the information that we've gained from this assessment to work out what the problem is and what we're going to do about it. So I'm going to take you through three different scenarios um, and we're going to have a think about the assessment process that we're going to go through. And then from that assessment, the information we've got from that, what's actually wrong with the patient and what do we need to do? So your first scenario here is you've got a 65 year old male patient. He's the first appointment with you, never seen him before, um, but he's got a treatment plan for some restorative work, so a number of restorations. 
He's got a fairly standard medical history for a man of his age. Um, he has simvastatin and atenolol that his doctors prescribed him. And he also takes out his tins in the summer. He appears absolutely as you would expect um, from a patient. He's quite chatty on the way up uh, along the corridor to your surgery. Um, takes his coat off, sits down, has a chat, everything's fine. But then as you start to try and take the history from the patient, the patient changes it's demeanour changes, it just seems confused, doesn't really know where he is, and he gets upset um, and agitated, and, and the appearance of his face has changed. So let's go through this assessment process that we talked about before. Okay then, so D, dangers. Um, so there's a bracket table nearby, so we're going to move that out the way. The patient is a 65 and a man who's quite smartly dressed. So we're also going to help him remove his tie and maybe just loosen the collar on his shirt, just to try and help him feel a bit more comfortable because we've said that he's, he's got quite agitated. In terms of response, I mean, he does respond, but not normally. Um, when you say to him, are you OK? Can you hear me? You know, he says, well, yeah, I can hear you. Um, but not in the way he has been responding to you up to that point. So therefore, we recognise there's a problem. So we need to get help. So you've got a nurse in the room. Um, you're going to ask the nurse to get the emergency kit. And at this stage, we can leave it at that because we don't really know what's wrong yet. Let's think about his airway then. Well, his airway is fine. There's no issues. He's talking to you. He's not um, wheezing. He's not hoarse or anything like that. There's no problem there. His breathing is a little bit faster than normal, but he's anxious. We've um, already established that. He's, he's got really confused and doesn't know what's going on. So increasing your breathing rate in those circumstances is relatively normal. So we're going to be OK with that. His circulation, however, does not appear to be normal. He's very pale um, and he's also clammy. Um, something doesn't seem right. So I want you to pause at this point. Think about the information I've given you, both previously in terms of his history and um, the assessment we've done there. And I want you to think about What's happening here and what are we going to do about it? OK, then. So what's happened? Well, this rapid change in demeanour and um, the fact that he's confused, he's got upset and also his face has changed all suggests, along with his medical history, because he takes um, an anti-lipid drug, a simvastatin for his cholesterol, and also a beta blocker, all these things suggest that the patient may be having a stroke. The importance here is to call an ambulance immediately. There is no time to wait here. Call 999, tell them that you suspect the patient is having a stroke. We think about the guidance that comes with having a stroke. We use the acronym FAST, which stands for Face, Arm, Speech and Time. Time is of the essence. Get the ambulance called. Tell them what's going on. There is the potential that this could be hypoglycemia, that the patient's blood sugar level is dropped because this sort of confusion and change in demeanour could match with that. However, the onset was very rapid, which would suggest it's not that. So I would go ahead and check the patient's blood glucose levels, but only once I had called an ambulance. Um, if it turns out the blood glucose levels are the problem, fine. The ambulance get there, you explain what happened, no harm done. If you spend time checking the blood glucose and thinking, oh, do we need glucose and all this kind of stuff before calling the ambulance, and that could be really significant in terms of the outcome of the stroke. So 
We're going to presume it's the worst case scenario first. Go to stroke quality ambience. Check his blood glucose levels. If they're low, then yes, we're going to give him a glucose drink as long as he remains conscious. The other thing to check is the patient's oxygen saturation. And you're going to see as we go throughout these scenarios, I'm always going to tell you to do that. Um, our emergency kits have a pulse oximeter in them. Put it on the patient's first finger. It will tell you the patient's oxygen saturation. Anything above 94% is fine. But if any patient has an oxygen saturation of less than 94%, they could benefit from oxygen. So pop it on if it's below that. And then the real thing with the stroke is just to sit with the patient, reassure them, try and keep them calm as much as possible. They're going to be frightened. Um, they also need privacy. There is absolutely no requirement for anybody else to be in the room apart from you and your nurse at this stage. Um, keep uh, other people at hand out the room if needs be, um, but tr do, don't have a, a um, conga line of people checking through the surgery. And certainly if they're in a public area, like for example, the waiting room, take them somewhere else so that they can be have a, a bit more privacy. Nobody wants people looking at them when they're feeling unwell. So by doing an assessment of this patient, we were able to work out what the problem was. Had we not gone through this assessment, we could have missed some vital things. So we could have missed the fact that the patient's circulation didn't appear normal. Ultimately, that's the problem with a stroke. It's that the circulation uh, to the brain is not normal. So it's important to go through this process to give you the information that you need. So let's think about our next scenario then. So in this scenario, we've got a child who's eight years old, quite a regular attender, come and see you often um, for preventative treatment. Um, say you've got some fishy sealants to do. As with most eight-year-old kids, perfectly clear medical history. Child is absolutely normal, um, quite chatty, quite play in the way that they normally are when they come and see you. They are absolutely fine during the clerking in, but almost immediately after you start your interval of exam, the kid goes really red in the face, really bright red. They're clutching at their, at their neck, at the collar um, of their school uniform, sort of really clutching at their throat and developed a really loud wheeze when they're breathing. So let's go through the assessment process for this patient. So as usual, we're going to start with D for ginger. In this case, you're not getting any sharp instruments around, you've not got to that point yet. So there's no danger present, we can just carry on as normal. In terms of response, well, they can acknowledge you when you said, are you doing okay? They've gone, they've, they've made a noise, but they can't respond normally because they're clutching at their throat and they're starting to panic. Um, and they've got this breathing issue. So next would be shout for help. Now, in these circumstances, we have a child with breathing difficulties. I would immediately go to calling 999. There's no harm in doing that. We still need to go through the rest of our assessment process. So, airway. Well, the airway is open but the wheezing as they're taking a breath in and out suggests that it's restricted. You're going to get the child to open their mouth as wide as they can and check there's nothing in there but in actual fact you had your hands in there just moments ago so you know there's nothing in there, they haven't choked and they haven't inhaled anything. The breathing is not normal. It is rapid and shallow. They are breathing, the patient is conscious, but not normal. The circulation is most definitely not normal. They are bright red in the face and they have blueness to their lips. So again, 
let's take the opportunity now to pause, think about what's wrong with this patient and what you're going to do about it. Okay then, so what's wrong? Well, this child doesn't have asthma. It's not in their medical history. They're not taking any medicines. It's also a very rapid onset. And it happened as soon as you touched that patient. They were fine before then, but as soon as you touched them. So those things would suggest that this breathing difficulty is not asthma. The other thing that tells us that this is not asthma is the rapid change in their colour of their face and their lips. The most likely situation here is that the patient has gone into anaphylaxis. So we need to check we've got an ambulance coming. We said before that we called 999 straight away because it was a child with breathing difficulties, but let's check. Um, the next thing we need to do is we need to uh, administer um, adrenaline. Adrenaline is the medical emergency drug available to us in the event of anaphylaxis. Um, you need to draw that up for the syringe um, and it's 0.3 millilitres for a child of this age. Nobody expects you to necessarily remember that in an emergency situation. Uh, I have put on Brightspace for you a list of medical emergency drugs and um, the symptoms that warrant their use and the dosage. And I would suggest something like that, a very easy, simple to use um, table or crib sheet should be kept with all emergency drugs because your mind goes blank unless you do this on a daily, weekly basis, your mind goes blank. So have that information written down clearly in big text where the medical emergency drugs are, but they need 0.3 millilitres of adrenaline. And the patient has a restricted airway. What happens with anaphylaxis is massive vasodilation, that's why everything goes red, and therefore all the airways narrow because they're swollen because of fluid and blood in the area. So their oxygen saturation may well be low. You would expect quite a rapid improvement with the adrenaline, but put the pulse oximeter on them. If it's below 94%, put oxygen on. You can always take it back off if the oxygen saturation rises above that. And with the adrenaline, if there's no improvement in five minutes, you're gonna to need to repeat that dose. You would hope that you had the emergency services with you by that stage, particularly with a child. Um, however, depending on your location, that may not be possible. So every five minutes, if there's no improvement. So this would be an easy one to make a presumption if you hadn't done your full assessment. You could easily think, oh, the child, they're having an asthma attack, give them some salbutamol. That would not help this patient at all. Because we've done our full, full assessment and we've recognised they've got a restricted airway, the breathing is not normal and they have the circulation issues, we can come to the um, outcome of it being anaphylaxis. Our last scenario then. So we've got a 37 year old female. Uh, she's type two diabetic. Um, it's diet and metformin controlled. She does say it's not that well controlled at the moment. Um, she has quite significant gum disease as well, which also would suggest that our diabetes is not well controlled. And um, so she's having a come in today for appointment for full mouth subgingival work. Um, she is a new mother. She's got a six month old baby and she's got two older children. And as you can imagine, her stress levels are quite high. Everything's quite normal um, until sort of midway through the appointment, the patient just seems to have become distant. She's not responding as she was. Um, she keeps closing her mouth. Now, when you ask her to open it again, she does, but then it closes again. And she just seems generally unaware of her situation and her surroundings. So, our normal assessment process. We've got D for danger. Well, this is a perio appointment, so there's lots of hand scalers in the way. So we're gonna remove all the sharp instruments out the way. 
When we check for a response, she sort of seems to get a fright. She's sort of startled. But then she does respond normally. So it takes longer than you would expect, but, but you do get a normal response. Still not what you would expect, though. So we're still going to get some help. In this situation, I would ask your nurse to get the emergency kit, just so you've got it there. But we don't know yet if we need anything here. In terms of airway, it's fine, all clear, no issues. The breathing is a bit slow. Um, slow and deep. And the circulation, well, there's no evidence of any issues there. We put a pulse oximeter on and it's fine. So there's something not right here. Pause the video, have a think about it. What is wrong with this patient and what do we need to do? The key to the outcomes of this is all in the patient's history. She's a new mother with two older children and she's stressed. She's fallen asleep. It happens. The long appointment, she's got local anaesthetic in, she's just taken the opportunity to lie down without children running around her feet and the exhaustion has kicked in. She doesn't need you to do anything apart from acknowledge the fact that the poor woman is shattered and is taking the opportunity, whether intentional or otherwise, to have it rest. I would check her blood glucose levels because that this sort of um, tiredness and malaise could be a sign that she's a bit low in the blood sugar. And if that is low, then give her a glucose drink. But ultimately, she doesn't need anything else from you. So this assessment process has shown us, that going through this process with this patient, has shown us we don't need to panic. We've got everything we need there, but actually she's, she's fine. The poor woman's just shattered. So that's just three possibilities. There's lots of other medical emergencies that can come up and you will have covered um, those in human disease already or to come. Um, but the real important message I want to give you here is the assessment's the important part. And using the same assessment process, regardless of the circumstances, allows you to have a logical, methodical approach that's easy to remember in a time when your stress and anxiety levels are going to be high. The other thing to remember is not all medical emergencies are related to the patient's medical history. If we think back to this scenario here, we said this patient was an uncontrolled diabetic. Without doing a proper assessment, we could rush straight in and think that she has a blood glucose issue and give her um, an inappropriately high amount of glucose. That could then cause an issue. She could then become hyperglycemic. And that's a slow stage process that will not show any issues in the surgery, but you know, maybe a few hours down the line at home when she then eats something again, is going to kick in. So by following this assessment process, we've been able to see that actually it's nothing to do with the medical history. There's something else going on. So medical histories are absolutely useful to know if it's more likely for these things to happen, but it doesn't mean that that's actually been the issue. So assessment using the Resus Council's um, algorithm of DRS ABC for all patients who present in any way different to what you would expect for that patient.